Hello, David. Hello, Moza. Hi. How are you? This is David Jackson. <laughs> I decided to start with a sneeze, scared the shit out of everyone. <laughs> Edit this out. <laughs> we can start again. Or do you, do you feel okay with this? Okay. No, we'll... no. <laughs> Good intuitive sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it doesn't hurt because we are miles apart, so nobody gets hurt. Not Perfect. Me. Um, okay, this is the first in a, what we hope will be a series of the Barra spoken word interviews and readings. David is here because he's just published a book, The Legend of Here and Now. And he's also, before he's um, performed at the Barras as a special guest. And the idea is that he will read something and then I'll ask him something because that's part of our uh, monthly spoken word evening is that usually there is a uh, an interview not always not everyone likes intrusive questions but i think you're sort of well capable of dealing with that and um yeah i think you, you know please just start and i'll uh, try not to interrupt you but i'll try to ask you things mm -hmm. play around with the view and see how it works okay david jackson yeah yeah, we'll have some fun. Um, I just wanted to say thanks. Thanks for having me. And thanks for putting this together. Um, it's it's really funny because when I lived in Ballery Hub, I used to, as you know, I used to try and go over to, to Clannacilty as much as I could uh -huh. to, go, um, to go to the nights that you had there and that you do have there. And uh, it was, I've said this at, at, at nights in the bars, you know, but I'll say it again for people on, online that, it was a time where I was really like starting to um, take new directions in terms of how I was performing live. And it was really nice to have the bars, to have um, the nights that you had there because it was um, just a really nice testing ground to kind of like feel into new ways of doing things. And the people there were really nice and really open and really accepting and such a lovely space. So I'm always thankful, you know, that, that you have that and that you run that. Um, and then obviously when I moved out here, it's quite far, you know, it's nearly over an hour to get the clan. So I haven't been able to get there as much anymore. Um, but this is cool because, you know, we can do it here live. So that's great. So I just want to say thank you. Um, oh, thank you for coming up on, on Zoom. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah um, it does open loads of new possibilities of, you know, you can connect with people around the world. And we could always do that, but now in the... This is April 2020, just in case. Uh, in the coronavirus pandemic, you know, people suddenly realize that they can't go anywhere live. We'll talk about that a bit later. And so, you know, we still want to connect, maybe more than that. Yeah, it's definitely, I mean, it's one of the big lessons that we're learning that, you know, um, we have this gift of technology that for the most part, it's done amazing things, but you know, we, we've probably neglected it a lot more. Like these phones or these, these gadgets that we have, you know, like we have the power like now to speak to people across large distances and across the world. But like, if you probably, if most people, including myself, probably added up the hours that they spend on their devices, it's probably not connecting with people. It's probably just, you know, scrolling or doing rubbish or whatever, you know, it's like, yeah, you can, you can learn stuff and you can look stuff up, but I think I think what I'm saying is after after all this is said and done, definitely connectivity is becoming becoming a heightened thing, you know. And it's like if you can learn to be have a good connection with someone through a device, imagine what life's going to be like when we get back together physically. Yeah. You know, it's going to be um, it's a real golden age for communication and connection and lots of other things. But yeah, it's brilliant. Okay, you want to read something from your book a little bit? Yeah, um, yeah. so I just had a quick flick this morning. Uh, literally, I was making a cup of coffee a while ago, and uh, I just had a quick flick through it. It's funny because um, normally when I create things, and including this, this book, you know, um, they're like individually created pieces and stuff. Uh, not individually, but they're all, they all, bits of it have their own energy and have their own life, you know. And, um, and then uh, it normally comes to a time where 
I have feel like I need to pull them together into something larger, like a book or music or whatever it is. So the reason why I'm saying that is because when I, when people, you know, when I say I look at my book, when I look at the book, it's very hard for me to kind of um, conceive of it in my mind in the linear way that's in a book, you know, like page five and then page eight and page 12 and stuff like that. Um, so I had to really look through it in, in the order of the book today to be like, all right, because in my mind, it's all like, it's all in a big mishmash mush of different things in different places, even though I can tap into different parts of it and I can start reciting bits for you now. When it comes to putting it in linear form of numbers on a book, I find it really difficult. And um, that was something I'm going to get to read in the book, but I just wanted to share that. That was something when I had my first book, when I actually went around and uh, performed it, I had to perform like, and I did it in the bars as well with yourselves. Um, you know, it was like chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four. And it was like that, um, that uh, almost limitation in a way, or that, um, what would you say, confinement to say, okay, or that structure, that's a better word. Having to do it in that structure, I found really difficult, you know, and it just goes to show how everyone is works so differently. Like I know you, Moza, are very good with planning and you're, like you were saying earlier, you, you actually are kind of the opposite in a way. It's like you, you, you like your structure, don't you? Well, I find, I mean, you only see the things that I do plan and that sort of material. Yeah. It's quite, it's hard for anyone, I think, because you have to, you have to force yourself to do something and re retain that focus and everything changes in between. And then you still have to go back to it. It is difficult. It, that's why it's difficult to write a book, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you did it, you did it twice. And also this, this the legend of here and now is a story. It's a sci-fi story, actually. So you did, yeah. Make, yeah. I'm quite interested to know where you, where you found it. But maybe you read a little bit. Yeah, so I'll, maybe I'll read a bit at the start. So just for anyone who doesn't know, like what the hell is am I about to hear? Um, so like mainly what I do is like poetry and spoken word and kind of, uh, rhyming language and rhythmic language is what that's like my strength you know so this book is consist uh, consists of um, loads of that and all of these little sections of verse are tied together i tie them together in this story this narrative that is the legend of here now and that story is 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 almost how i put it on a timeline if that makes sense you know because obviously you have i could pluck out any bits of these verse and they kind of exist in their own space of, you know, whether you listen from now or 20 years, they would still have the same energy, you know, or the same kind of, you could still refer to it is what I'm saying. But the narrative is like the timeline that I put it on, you know, so that you'd say, okay, the story starts here and it ends here. So that's how it's pieced together. Um, so what will I read at the start? So I'll read you uh, my foreword just the start at the very start and get really linear. Um, and it's very short, but I think it's really important. Um, and it's go the foreword is this for the book. It says, this content becomes fictional at the point where your imagination cannot perceive it as a possibility. It is our belief that makes it so. Your truth is your own. And without like overly describing that, you know, I wrote that in the foreword because I do believe that my own personal belief anyway is that whatever you believe to be true, whatever, however conservative or crazy it is, if you really believe it, in, you know, right down to your bones, then that is a reality to you. You know, I think every, everyone, every one of us lives in our own kind of reality in a way. We have, we all have our own, type of perceptions of the world and um you know you see it over and over like you know it's like the story of the man who thinks he's blind and genuinely cannot thinks he cannot see but he goes to the doctor and the doctor examines his eyes and says well your eyes are absolutely perfect you know you've got 20 20 vision as far as i i can tell you know but the man cannot cannot see and it's and maybe physically his eyes are fine but it's just like the power of the mind you know it's like he believes so strong that he can't see that he can't you know so anyway that's why i have that in there in the foreword because there's lots of layers of stuff in this book some 
um, to some people might be very believable, to some people might not be, you know, it's just like wild sci-fi. Um, and that's kind of the intro introduction, just to say, you know, take take what take what sits well with you, and if it doesn't, just chuck it out the window. Um, now, let me just read something else, because I'm doing a lot of chit-chatting. Um, I suppose I'll go into the, the a bit of the first chapter here, um, and this is kind of following on in the same theme. So the first chapter is called Beginning Anew, and Anew is spelled, spelled A-N-U, like the goddess Anew. So it goes like this, it says, a parent is laying their child to sleep. All the wonders of the day are still racing through its mind. The bedtime stories we tell our children are not only a means of, confronting, of comforting their imagination, but they give a sense of purpose and reference in this world. It's the stories that are seeded in our minds as children that grow to become the tales which we use to forge our destiny. They become the voices and characters which narrate our inner world. The voices of my inner world, the one who guide my transcribing hand, came both from land and sky. I have learned, like the tree, that my expansive canopy of thought, the heights of new perceptions, depend totally on my rootedness in the here and now. Without this grounded anchoring presence on the planet, I cannot photosynthesize the etheric whispers into structured, crystallized sugars of verse. Um, so and then it, it starts breaking into a um, poem. I'll read a little bit of the poetry side of it. So, so it says, so let me begin this story by saying that me and the celestial nations, we came to bless you with reverence and patience as we await the earthquaking changes, bursting the foundations which insulated us from the ground instigating a separation from root shock or the crown. News and gossip will swallow you in a cloud and leave your future foggy. You're probably better to chew knowledge and view some new options, spit it out once it's solid and you've decided upon it and dare to remain faithful to everything you have promised. So for the next little while, I want to invite you to join me as we taste the flavors with senses that we've disabled and labeled as being mental or ill health to face it. The naysayers who say that eccentrics are way stranger have never been in danger of breaking the mold that made them. So have no fear because we're all weirdos here. Army mother. <laughs> well, it, it, it's funny how, how or funny, like, now you speak it yourself because some of the poetry that's in there, I heard you say speak years ago. Um, but I think you still re it's still in your head, like and yeah. this is more like prose, and this is absolute poetry. Mm -hmm. So you don't know the first thing of of the top of your head, but you know the second thing. So to to you, what's the difference between prose and poetry, or this kind of spoken po poetry? Um, I think the rhyme definitely helps because it's tied together. Um, and it, that's, that's kind of like how I learned that was where my writing when it began, you know, it was in rhyme, it was in, it was in rap music, it was in rhythm, it was in, um, in that kind of use of words. So that's kind of like my, my default, you know, that's like my baseline. And um, the, the prose or the, that kind of, I don't even know the language for it. I suppose prose, you could call it, I imagine it like novel writing or whatever you call it. Um, that to me, like I can still do it, but it's not, it, it's not like, um, I don't know. It just doesn't, it doesn't really sit. It doesn't really sit in, in the forefront of my mind in the same way. You know, it's like, um, probably because it's, to me, it's like every language, like even now, you know, this is a prose. I'm just like telling you a story and it's just like, it's just everyday language that we've just polished. You know, it's like if I had a conversation with you and then I wanted to go back and rehab that conversation, there'd probably be bits that you trim out to make it cleaner. And that's all prose or novel writing is. It's just everyday language that's been like polished up. Um, and then, but the difference, I think my brain categorizes, not categorizes, but it just stores the kind of rhyme in a different way. It doesn't even store it actually, because people often say to me like, how do you remember all these, this stuff? And I'm like, I always tell them I don't remember because it's just like opening a file somewhere. And um, I don't know, is that describing it well? 
but once once you kind of get on it with anyone who's written a, a, a rhythm or with a rhyme you know once you get that first line or that even if it's the middle line you know it's like you're, you're kind of on the track and it pulls you along um probably doesn't really describe it very well Moza, but i'm trying my best uh but, but I'm, definitely i'm really distracted because i have a huge uh, bumblebee here in it <laughs> it was <laughs> okay sorry I'll either it, I'll, I'll try it. I'm not sure how to get it out. Anyway, uh, it's on the wrong side of the window. Anyone wants to get out? <laughs> Simple. Do you want to? I would say, I would, what, what, since I've, I think probably you, what you're saying about your brain it would be lovely to put the kind of, you know, these, the, I can't remember what you call it, but you put it on top of your head and you can see which parts of the brain are lighting up. It's probably in a different part of your brain. Like, I think so. Like the musical part or the intuitive part or something like that. I want to say something about the goddess Anu. Can you say something about that? Yeah, she. Um, well, the the the, the goddess Anu and the two of the are kind of um, they feature in the book and they, they come into the stories. So they're they're for, this for, um, for people who are listening who are not in Ireland. Could you explain? Okay. That well, because you know. So. Um, the they're they're the people that were believed to have um, brought the magic to Ireland. You know, some people say they were mythical races and they didn't exist, and then other people say that they were an actual race of beings who were then you know imagined to be more magical or powerful than they were. There's lots of different uh, things, um, but in there's a, a thing called the Book of Invasions in Ireland, which is like uh, document that uh, is the history of all the people who have come to Ireland and these are one of the people that came before the, the Celts came to Ireland um, and when we speak of the fairies or the magical folk or the people that live in the land, the spirits of the land they're actually talking about the Tuatha Dé because as the story goes is that when the Celts came um, and it's a, it's a much longer story than this I'm really just given given the bare minimum um, that they surrendered part of the land. They surrendered um, the upper part of the land where we live above ground to the, the Celts and then the two they then went to the lower world below the earth um, and they live in they live in the earth below. Um, and there's lots of other stories like that in different tribes in different parts of the world about beings living under 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 the ground and things like that. Um, so anyway, Anu is the mother of this tribe. She is the she is the goddess. She is the she. It's a it's a, a matriarchal society. So the the female is is kind of like the top of the apex, not even the apex because that's not really probably not the right imagery. But anyway, it's it's um it it's centered like that, and that's who Anu is, and the tribe is Tua Day Danin. So it's the the Tua means tribe, and it, it was the Tua Day Danu, and then. Over time, it became made again when the the, patri the patriarch came in, or the, the things became more masculine. It changed from two day Danu to two day Danin, and it became masculized. And um, yeah, and there's loads of stories about different characters, and there's a rich, rich mythology of different things. And like you could be on forever uh, talking about it, but that's who she is, and that's that they're the people. So in a way, your story is both sci-fi and really ancient Celtic. Is that mythical Celtic? Yeah. There is, there is, a, especially at the start. Um, so uh, maybe, maybe I'll read a little bit just to give a bit of context. Yeah. So we, um, in the story, the story basically starts with uh, some stuff, and I'm talking about different things, and um, I meet up with a, a character from these times called Ku Colin, and. Cú Cullen is a famous um, character in Irish in Irish uh, mythology, and he's kind of like the Irish Hercules. And the story goes that his father was uh, a person called Lou or Lou La Fada, um, or Lou the Shining One. There's different different names for him. And Lou was one of these characters from the Two Day Danim, the people from before it then. And Cú Cullen lives in the time when the two Tana, two of the Danon have gone into the earth, you know, but there's still remnants and the, it's still a time when people still believe very strongly in it. And 
uh, people still pray to these gods and and different stories of um, these these two day down and peoples these magical race coming up onto the surface level and actually sometimes even having children with with some of the us mortals and then you have these these demigods like who Cullen and these characters you know again it's something you see across the board in in, in stories um, but anyway the story in this story it starts with me and Ku Cullen and me and Ku Cullen want to try and figure out this story that that is told in the book so we go to um, Gugambara and we go to connect with his father Lou because Lou is associated with being a solar god or a god of the sun so for example there's a Celtic festival called uh, Lunasa which is kind of like the harvest festival in autumn and that's associated with the sun because it's a celebration of the bounty that the sun and the earth have given so it's like the mother and the father you know the sun sends down these lights uh, light energy and that that light impregnates the earth and the earth becomes pregnant and gives birth to all of the life and plants and food and animals and everything that comes from it so yeah the story be, story kind of begins a little bit like that and uh I'll read a bit here, where are we? Um, yeah, so I'll read because I was talking about light. So this is in uh, Gugambara, and myself and Ku Cullen have gone there to try and connect with his, his father to get a bit of insight into the, the story we want to tell. And it says, light is information. It is a requirement and precursor for life. We need this energy to bring life into formation. And this light transmitted from our sun illuminates like the great monks of Iona, bringing color to a parchment. The solar light moves within us and illuminates our genetics. Your DNA is much like the long scrolls of parchment on which the mysteries of the universes were etched. This light enlivens the strands of DNA like a projector does a film and tells them what to bring into form in the movie that is the human life. And I'll read a little bit about, I'll kind of fast forward a bit, and this is a bit where we get chatting to Lou. Um, so Lou comes down the mountain, and he, he comes over the mountain and um, he speaks to myself and Ku Cullen, and he tells us about this, this solar light that, that is within us. And he says, I see the true sun you smother inside you all. I see how you covered it with lies and loads of the latest fashion. I see ladies buying foundation, but never grounding their passion. I see boys turn to men and never express sadness. And I've seen how the toys you invent, they often destroy magic. But you know, the repercussions from everything you have dusted beneath the rug is now coming to peak in your self-destruction. Let not this eruption corrupt your peace, just release without obstruction and function free. And I don't mean just some hippie serendipity stuff. I mean the birth of an epiphany, that your purpose is in, perf in perfect symmetry with all the services the universes give to thee, a gift of symphony, harmonizing your history with a future infinity. Um, um, then, did you write that? When did you write this? This, la this latter bit? Because the book appeared that, in March? It was finished in, or you, you the, was published. You, you got the copies in March, early March, before the. But when did you write? I would, I would say probably back in 2018 when I brought out the first book. I probably had about 50% of this written, this new book. Because it sounds almost like you sort of predict the whole pandemic thing. Or how. Um, look at, this this crisis i mean you know from very rational to like i don't want to say it's like a, a punishment but it does in some ways it, it feels like it has brought us to a place where more people are reconsidering whether we should be living as we have done 100 percent. i mean there's it's um i suppose in a simple way of saying it it's a bit of a reality check you know um and i think i think what i what i wrote there i don't i don't think it was anything predicted in terms of what could happen now I, like i had no insight into what was happening now like like a, a lot of this was written a while back um 
And I suppose the final threads that actually stitched it together was only in the last six months, you know, because I had a lot of the poetry written and then I really kind of worked on the narrative to bring them together. But I think why there might be stuff in it that's relevant now is because a lot of the stuff that I write, I'm looking at my own life first and foremost and, you know, what's going on myself and what I can do to better myself and figure out my own my own journey and my own stuff. Um, but then, you know, inevitably when you look at yourself, you start seeing that reflection in the whole, in all of humanity and you start to see, you know, because we're all, we all deal with similar stuff. Um, so, like, for example, that line there, you know, everything you have dusted beneath the rug is now common to peak in your self-destruction. Um, you know, I could see how much that modern society, there's so much, like, pain and suffering in the world that is, like, swept under the rug for people to live, you know, the lives that they live, you know, um, whether it's, you know, how you get your iPhone or how you you know, how your food gets delivered to your door or whatever it is, you know, it's like there's all there's always a bit of give and take. That's always been the case in the world. But I think there's been certain areas have been taking more and leaving less for others, you know, and that and and it's the same for nature and the environment and everything, you know. And um and I suppose that has been bubbling for a long time, especially in the last 10, 20 years, you know, it's really been getting to that extreme. So that's why that's in there. And and when I say it's, you know, coming to peak in our self-destruction. I don't mean that. I don't mean that it's, um, it wasn't written to be like, oh, we're going, we're, that this is to destroy ourselves. But it, like, you can actually, you could, you could almost see in society how people were kind of consciously and unconsciously destroying themselves, you know, like up until a few, up until a couple of years ago, like from my teenage years up till my mid twenties, you know, I like, I used to like drink and, do drug crazy like you know I and because that was socially acceptable you know like on a weekend or whenever you're finished work you meet up with friends and you just party and it's like whatever about drugs but like you know drink like you know it's it's I don't and I'm not trying to talk about drink but what I'm saying is that like there's so many things that people do that actually you know is such a detriment to their life and even if even like positions we put ourselves in in terms of work and things that we decide to do because ultimately we choose to do everything you know um and we just put i think we just you know it's self-punishment maybe on some level because on some level maybe we're subconscious of like it's to blind us numb us out from the fact that like everything is so unfair in the world you know uh, and so not even unfair but just unequal in in the way that we live uh, with other people and with, with the nature you know um so I don't think it's predicted. I think it's just like, it was just a, a reflection of the sign of the times, you know, and, and I'm not the only one to think that. There's millions and millions of people um, out there. And like you said about, um, you know, we're at that time when, when you were talking about communication at the start, you know, we're at that time now where people are being forced to face that, you know, um, everyone's being forced to like take a good step back and look at like, you know, what's important, what are your priorities and stuff like that. So I don't, know, I don't know if that's answered your question. I feel like that was a, a politician answer. <laughs> it is. It is in some ways. I mean, the same question goes with this question: is Do you uh, feel that we could start to change things, especially in the way how we relate with nature, within a, sh a shortly? I mean, sometimes I'm hopeful that we'll start to change those things straight away. The moment the lockdowns are lifted, etc. But you know, there's other forces that don't want us to, or that you know want to keep things as they were before. Are you in any way hopeful that it's possible to change things rapidly? Hundred percent, I think so. I like your answer. <laughs> I'll vote for you. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. I think. Uh... I think if anything, it's more possible now than ever because everyone, everything has stopped, you know. It's very hard to, it's like when you go, it's like when, it's much easier to play a gig somewhere that you've booked than it is to go busking on the street. Because if I throw a gig and say, David Jackson's gonna be here babbling for two hours, come and pay 
at the door and come and listen. And if 100 people show up, which would be amazing, and they had showed up to listen, it's very easy in a way for me to perform there because those people have come in a way knowing what they're going to get and they're there and all I have to do is show up and do my thing. But if I go on the street, and I've, I've done this many times down, down through the years, you know, it's like, if, if you ever, and this goes to any performer in any sense, if you ever want to hone your craft, go and try busk on the street. Mm -hmm. Because when you go and busk on a street, it's very different because people are in their lives. People are on the way to work. They're collecting kids. They're going to the gym, whatever they're doing. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to pull them out of their reality, out of their timeline and kind of stop and join your reality for a short little while. And that's very hard to do, you know, to hold people's attention when they're not, when they haven't planned on connecting with you, you know? Um, and I think that's like what the planet is in now, you know, it's like, we were never going to change as a collective while some people were still running to the, you know, running around doing whatever they were doing, you know, going to work, going to whatever, you know, it was never going to work. We needed something. We needed a concert that would bring everyone to the stage. Do you know what I mean? And everyone's attention. And to me, the, the virus thing, that narrative, that's that timeline, you know, that's the one story. That's the one gig that everyone is, is paying attention to. And that has brought us all to, to a collective timeline does that make sense well um i hadn't thought about that a collective timeline so mm. are you saying that there, everyone was on their own little timeline and now we're on more on a collective path or would that go you know around the world that would be great i think i think it's just like a it's an option now that the collective have you know like at the end of the day we can all live in our own timeline, in our own reality, you know. I can I can be totally oblivious to what's going on in the world and just go up on go up on the mountain there and my only awareness is connected into the rocks and the plants and the trees. Grand. I can do that. But this gives that option that everyone can can connect with. And I don't mean tune into like the fear or tune into whatever, but it's just like be aware of a reality where the whole world has stopped and people have people have um paused you know and it's like everyone has that invitation now in a way you know to actually be like yeah i'm living in a world where this is happening um and it's it's there in that space and then once you once you agree that yeah this is this is in my world this is what's happening in my reality this is what's around the world then whatever you do or this this is just what i think moses my own belief so I'm in this reality now where the world has stopped and everyone's paused and, and there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of love and there's a lot of different things flying around. But while I'm in this space, whatever I do to change myself, whatever I do to um, do differently, whatever I decide, habits or belief systems that I change, that then affects everyone else on that timeline, on this timeline and everything else that, that you do and that the people around you you know, maybe maybe your next door neighbor of 80 years of age has started growing vegetables in our garden that she hasn't done for 50 years, you know, and that now is adding to the collective consciousness, you know, and um, that's, that's my take on it. And it's all the things that we choose to do, even if it's just in your bedroom or your back garden, it's like how we change individually will, will, will affect the collective. And that's always been the way, but it's just more potent now because everyone's kind of, we're all in the same boat in a way, you know. Okay, I, uh, can I put in a request for the dawn of our death? <laughs> the dawn of our death? The dawn, yeah. That's, which chapter is that now? It's on page 40. Brilliant. Yeah. The dawn of our death. Or right, not 40, 30, 38. Ah, uh, yeah. You don't have to read it all, but... Uh, okay, I mean, I really like the lines on page 40, but if you want to introduce it as well, I don't know what the lines were for. Yeah, well, I suppose this, um, it, in the story in this, though, there's a main character who comes in who I haven't spoken about yet, and this character is called Anish, and Anish ends up going on a bit of a journey and connecting with different different um, things like rivers and trees and mountains and uh, all different things and she learns lessons as she goes and connects with these different spirits and energies and uh, this chapter dawn of our death I might just um, this is just I suppose to introduce it 
uh, she starts a conversation with the moon and there's a full moon rising as she's climbing the mountain and um, the moon is telling her some stuff. So I'll, fa I'll skip some of the start of it just because there's a good bit there. And I'll jump in somewhere. Okay. This whole globe is a soul and we are fragments of its crystal heart standing in position in the image of a star. Together we are constellations and although we are spread apart, we are never not connected. Our love leaves time and space transcended. When you think a thought, I feel you send it. When thinking of your falls and lessons, don't think of them as flaws you step in because then we all feel affected. You see, we don't just think but feel collective. I feel pride in your perfection, but I feel the doubt that you've collected. So let's ask this ground to hold and help us and invoke the strength of those that left us. We will harvest and reap the tears that we weep for our dearly departed deceased. We will use them to water seeds so we can grow from our grief and mold our emotions into a moment of peace. Peace within oceans of beliefs which float us from shore to shore of what we're sure to be real. To cure this dis-ease, we must restore the course that will lead to the source of its grief. The source of separation that leaves a sword in between the core of our being. We feel like oceans apart when Moses parted the sea, but pardon my speech while I impart the path that is key. We all started as stardust, remarkably marvellous. It's still a sparkling part of us inside the hearts that have hardened up. That's, that's some of the moon chats. Oh, that's beautiful. And you're speaking to everyone in a way. You don't think, think there are sort of, you know, chosen people or... Because people do want to identify themselves with different groups in a way, like different families or star families or light workers or whatever, you know, it's like, but maybe we all are. Isn't that the case? Or could be if we wanted to. Not everyone wants to be like, you know, some people are like working with the dark. I, again, I suppose it first I'd say again, it depends what you believe. Um, but in my again, I suppose I can only talk from my own belief. I think I think that all the different formats and different words, you know, we like to put things in boxes because it just makes it easier for the kind of human brain to, to comprehend things and compartmentalize things, you know. And and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, you know. It's like it's fine for me to say, okay, you know you're planting trees, you're the person who plants trees, I'll be the person who plants vegetables, you be the person that builds houses and that way I know who to go to when I need something, you know, and, and that's fine that, you know, but on the other side of that is, I think, yeah, like we, we have that, everyone has the potential to be anything. Um, and if you want to add another layer to that, it's like, yeah, okay, we all have the potential to be anything but we're all probably have our own individuality that is lean towards a certain thing you know what I mean so for example if I really wanted to learn the guitar and be good at guitar I probably could and I definitely could if I you know if, if I actually exerted the time and focus and anyone technically could do that but there are some people who have a natural gift for it you know whether that's genetic or whether it's they've just grew up around it or whatever but they have they're imposed a certain position that they're um you know they it makes more sense for them to be the amazing guitarist than me you know and i think that's the case for most things you know certain people um are you could call it destined you could call it faded or or you could just call it evolution whatever you want to call it it doesn't matter but certain people are definitely um you know, better at some things than others, but that's not to say that you can't do anything. Essentially, you know, if you put your mind to it, you can do and be anything. But I suppose you got to ask yourself, um, what do you want? A, eh? you know, and then also, um, what, what, where are you best of service? You know, 
um, where are your talents and skills best of service and where and what do you want to do with those those talents and skills you know that's what I'd ask myself anyway that's what I do ask myself yeah sorry I was a bit distracted because I said I want to ask you a question about your uh, because you also released a uh, because you were talking about guitar and I thought okay you also released a digital album called State Sentient and this, I mean, I really love listening to it. It's very varied. There's there's voices on there, and I was wondering who the, there's this there's a man talking. It's not you. I thought it would be nice to end with that actually. Uh, John Moriarty. That's John Moriarty. It's the poet. But, yeah, John Moriarty. But, I, yeah, he's in a track called uh, Stone Fashions. He's what? And, the the song is called Stone Fashioned. Okay. And um, a few years ago, a friend of mine introduced me to John Moriarty, whose work I absolutely love. And um, he basically gave me a collection of audio uh, that is just a collection of uh, interviews with him and um, him telling stories and all different things. And there's a few hours of it there. And uh, yeah, there's a clip to clip in that song stone fashion is one of my favorite bits that, that he talks about um do you want do you want me to to say it to the people or to say it to, well yeah go ahead i just think um, i mean we've 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 talked for a while i can't remember how long maybe half an hour three quarter of an hour uh so i thought we at the end when we finish here i yeah. just put on your the start of your uh, <laughs> of your album as a kind of outro I didn't think okay. that would be possible because you know, I don't know how to edit, but that would be a good ending. Perhaps. Yeah, that'd be nice. Um, yeah, so the voice, the voice of the guy you'll hear in, in the song in Stone Fashioned is uh, John Moriarty. He's from Kerry. Um, I, I, I'm not really going to ramble too much about him. You can look him up. He's got, the man is dead now, um, but he's got books and you will you clips of things online. Um, just a great mind. Um great perspective on things and uh, yeah you know it's just at the end of the day I suppose if I loop it all the way back again to the start it's like whatever you believe is totally into what you believe um, and I think that's the great thing when we share like this you know when we share whether it's books or conversations or music or whatever it is it's like it's not it's not about converting people to believe one thing or another it's just sharing perspectives and if something sits well with you and something that, um, you know, gives you a better perspective that on your own life or gives you a better way of looking at things, then you adopt it. And if you don't like it, you don't adopt it. And I put John in this song because there was a lot of stuff that um, resonated with myself and kind of uh, there was a lot of things that he, I've heard him say that I felt, but I hadn't been able to express. I hadn't nailed it down in words. Um, but anyway... You will, uh, I hope you enjoy that piece, uh, it's yeah. fashion. I haven't found it yet, I've only got the first piece. But um, can I ask you one other question before we leave it? It's, it's you know, you, it's always uh, when people write something, how much of it is real to them? You start off with that in your foreword. Um, how much of what you write about is actual, really real to you? like the, the, the girl that is your protagonist, is she real to you or do you feel that she is somewhat uh, an imaginative, ima imaginary uh, figure that you channel through or how, how does it work? Um, I mean, it's not easy to say that, of course. I, I know what you mean. Um, that's a good question. I haven't really thought about that till now. Uh, I think just my, uh, I feel, I should say, I feel that more so that what she represents in terms of the journey she goes and the things that she learns and the messages in it um, and the whole kind of story of herself and the cosmos and her, her star families and stuff like that, that idea is very real to me. But her as an individual, like as a, an actual person that could be standing next to me, it do doesn't feel real. Like she's more of a, she's a metaphor. Um, but then again, her name is Anish, which means now. You know, and her brother's name is on show, which is here. So the the idea, I suppose, the reason why I gave them those names is because 
those names obviously represent the here and the now. So the here and the now is a real thing. Like here and now we are having this conversation. Even if you people are listening or watching after, it's still here and now for you. And that here and now is a real thing. That is a real character. It is a real presence, you know, and you know that presence. And that's a presence that everyone knows because you know when you're with someone and you're talking to someone. And like you said at the very start, Moza, um, when we were, were chatting earlier, um, you were interested in terms of can that energy of a live performance be recreated via this kind of stuff? Well, I think in a little way it can because, just a little bit in a way it can because you can tell when someone's being present. You know, if you're in a conversation with someone and they're not really present and listening, you feel that energy, that presence of here and now isn't there. You can tell they're they're off somewhere else, even if they're not on their phone. Could you tell that when I was when I was looking, I've now found stone fashion online, but so I can end with that. But could you see? I mean, does that? You probably can see it, but you also feel it. Do you feel that? I think, I think, I think, I think people can feel it. I think, I think. Um, you feel when someone's still connecting to you when they're you know they're they're present with you so as a character anish and on show you know these these are however you imagine them you know they're not real but what they represent is real the here and now is a very real thing it's a very real force and i think i suppose just in final words like that's something i suppose that's the big lesson in my mind anyway that that humanity is learning outside of everything else, outside of politics, outside of money, outside of food, outside of all of that stuff, I think the big lesson that, that we're learning as a collective is to be here and now. Um, and when you're here and now, that's where the change happens. It doesn't happen in your head tomorrow, what you're planning. It doesn't happen what happened yesterday. It happens here and now. Um, and that's why they're the main characters in the book. And that's why, and that's what they represent. So, okay. Um, that's, I'm, I'm going to start with Stone Fashioned. I'm not going to do it all because it's eight minutes, I think almost nine. So I'll just cut off the recording that I haven't learned how to fade out Zoom, but maybe we'll get to, <laughs> get to that. Okay, I should say that after this recording finishes, uh, David will, God willing, fingers crossed, uh, be there to answer live questions from his own page so we'll post a link underneath um the the pre-recorded zoom interview and uh you will then you can then send your uh questions in or put them in the comments and he'll try and answer you in real time there and then okay thank you very much david jackson thank you Moza. okay it was lovely talking to you and thank you everyone for listening <laughs> see you soon aside to see this great sight why the bush burns and is not being consumed and as he's approaching the voice calls out Moses Moses and Moses says here am I and the voice comes back to him and it's a divine voice it isn't any longer an angelic voice we now think it is a divine voice and the divine voice is saying to it put off thy shoes from off thy feet for the ground whereon thou standest is holy ground now all ground is holy ground even if you're to stand in the Dublin tips of the Dublin dumps, like it is holy it is holy ground, holy ground, holy ground.
let myself grow at an oak's pace Just so I could take the breath of a nice sage To reflect on the rhymes I make And make them everlasting And you can call me old fashioned But back in the day you know we used to fashion stone Into monuments of magic, much of them still standing now much of the youth are tuned into music as useless as plastic Made for one use before you trash it We need to combat this unsustainable madness Nothing's unattainable when we caught the complaining And come about the cranium of thought we are slaving in Chain to the conditions we created after listening to different opinions Which stated how decisions we are making In this instant are related to the distance we are willing to take Face to face with other alien races Who maintain the rate that we raise the vibrations